Well, how have you been? Too busy. Too, too busy. busy. This is my friend Ozzy. Hello, Ozzy. Okay. I'm going to take him for his first flight. We have yeah. 07 x ray. Sure. This is the, the book for the airplane that tells us all the information about it from the previous pilots. I'm going to read through here, see if there's anything in here I need to know about. And I'm going to go out and inspect the aircraft to make sure everything's all fine there. So, how about you hang out here in the office? You have comfy couches. Don't take a nap, though. Coffee, bathrooms, everything. Just uh, take a break for a little bit, put in that seat. And I'll come in in about 10 to 15 minutes, like you. I'll head out to the airplane. All right. No squawks, no problems? No. Nope. Should be good to go. I think we are good to go. It's a good day to fly, but then I say that about every day. <laughs> it's always a good day to fly. Today's safety video from Faro Aviation is the practical pre flight. When I say practical, I mean, how do we make a pre-flight safe and efficient and thorough so that we can ensure safety of flight but make sure it's also enjoyable and not stressful? You saw we started the flight with a passenger in the front office and I asked them to stay there while I conducted my pre-flight out here at the aircraft. I don't mind them being out here, but it's just one less distraction I have to manage. They're in there relaxing, I can come here and make sure everything's all in order. Once we're set and ready to fly and I've declared the aircraft airworthy, I'll go in and collect my passenger, bring him out here to the aircraft, and we'll go out and have an aviation adventure. You also saw in the office that I took the key book for the airplane and inspected for any squawks or discrepancies. Those would have been noted by prior pilots, and they might be something that makes this aircraft unflyable or not mission ready. Perhaps a landing light, and I want to have it at night, or a transponder, not operable, and I want to go into the Class Bravo airspace. Both of those would be no-go conditions, and I want to make sure I know those before I get out to the airplane and invest the time in all of the pre-flight inspection. As I approached the aircraft, I started the pre-flight when I left the door, looking at the airplane from a distance. Does it seem right? Has it been parked in the proper spot? Is it parked on the center line? Are the ties and shocks installed properly? The control lock, the pitot cover, were the doors locked? That tells me a lot about how the previous pilot took care of the aircraft. That gives me confidence or perhaps less confidence depending on the condition in which I find it. This is all information I'm building about the airworthiness and condition of the airplane. It started out there a hundred yards away or so. It's a very simple example. Here in the Cessna 172 SP, one of the last items on the checklist after shutting down is to move the fuel selector either to the left or the right. And that's simply to keep fuel from going from one tank to the other if it's parked on a slope. It really doesn't affect the safety of flight, but it's on here and it's a courtesy to the guy who's going to fuel the aircraft next. It's correctly on the left hand side. That tells me the previous pilot took proper care of this rental aircraft. From your very first flight, your instructor emphasized the importance of the use of the checklist. No doubt they introduced you to both the checklist that came with the aircraft manual, which is in the back here, they may have used their own commercial checklist. I use checklists from a company called Checkmate. I find them organized quite well, and with even with different aircraft, they have the exact same layout, and that keeps me consistent on my pre-flight inspection. A couple of important notes on the checklist. First is, you don't have to go through things in the order that they have on here. They print them based on what they think makes sense, but perhaps you have a better idea, especially in terms of efficiency. If, for example, you followed the Cessna flight manual, you'd walk around the airplane a few times if you did everything in the order that they suggest. Versus the Checkmate checklist, you might go six times. It's just how they order things. I do all the different steps, make sure that I've done them all, and then go back and confirm them. So it's a verify that I've completed all of them. The checklist is really up to you what else you'd like to put on it. Just like the FARs, you can never go below the minimums they specify you can always have personal minimums. You might want to say, I'll have water in the airplane or oxygen. One of the things I don't have printed on my checklist, but I advise to all of my passengers, the last item, of course, is to use the bathroom. One thing I find some pilots doing on their checklist and their inspection is doing their interior check once they're actually sitting in the seat, seat belt, shoulder harness on, seat moved all the way forward. Makes it somewhat difficult to actually get to different areas inside the cockpit and properly make sure everything is all in order, especially if you have to do something over your shoulder in the rear seat, such as get the headset plugs done for a passenger. So I recommend that you do that interior portion of your checklist 
just like this, standing outside the aircraft where you have full latitude to make sure, oh, I have to remove the control lock, change the fuel selector, plug in my headsets, whatever you need to do up here, much easier when we're standing outside the aircraft. As an example, check the charge on the fire extinguisher. A lot easier to do it like that than to try and crane your head around once you're all strapped into the aircraft. One other final note on the interior inspection is where you put your equipment, your flight bag. I put my flight bag in the seat not behind myself, but in the other side. Makes it much easier to reach over my shoulder into the opposite seat than to try and go right around behind me to grab something. Just simplifies life later in the flight. It's an easy enough thing to take care of while standing right here on the ground, preparing the interior of the aircraft for the flight. One of my suggestions to students is to start their inspection at the same point on each aircraft each time. That way they can keep track of where they are on the checklist. In the case of the 172, I start here at the static port. I'm going to go counterclockwise around the aircraft and in back here at the static port. I'm not doing all the steps on the checklist. I'm simply going through some of the ones that might not have been explained so thoroughly. Stall horn, this aircraft, it's a mechanical reed and it requires you to actually have suction through this port. Don't just simply glance at it and say, yes, the port is there. You actually need to hear that squawk to know that it's working. You're also allowed to push and pull on the airplane to make sure that the structure is sound. This is what turbulence is like in the airplane. It certainly can handle it on the ground. I've just done two things there. If there was any water in the fuel tanks that was sitting on ribs, I've just freed it up so it can go down to the sumps. I've also listened to hear if there's anything loose, either in the struts with the wings or the landing gear. Feel free to do that, however, move it by the metal, not by the plastic. The empennage is where I spend perhaps the most time during the pre-flight inspection because it's the control and moving surfaces back here that maintain the safe and controlled flight of the aircraft, the elevator and the rudder. In the 172, we can move those surfaces like that. Some other aircraft don't like to be moved that way. And in particular, what I'm looking for are the castle nets and the cotter pins that are connecting the elevator to the controls. And that I can move the elevator through its full range of travel as well as the rudder. I'm basically making a box that you would do with a yoke. When you check to make sure that the controls inside the aircraft are free around your knee boards, headset cables and the like, I'm making sure that they can mechanically move back here as well. Two really important notes back here, when you move the rudder, always move it by the bottom edge, that's the strongest, and never move it by this surface here. This is a trim tab, but it's not adjustable from inside the cockpit. It's only adjusted on the ground. It's the rudder trim tab, and if you inadvertently hit it, you can actually cause the aircraft to go out of yaw trim. Oil is the lifeblood of an aircraft engine like this. It gives us lubrication as well as cooling. And you know it's important to verify that you have a sufficient amount of oil before each flight. Down with a dipstick and checking the amount. That part's easy. The part I wanted to emphasize up here is when you return the dipstick, finger tight is all. Don't apply any extra pressure on it because if you tighten it too much, when it heats and cools as the engine is turned on and then turned off, it can expand and become incredibly tight, making it very difficult to remove in the future, requiring tools or excess force, which can lead to damage. Finger tight is fine. After all, once the door is closed, even if the dipstick pops out, it's not going to depart and the oil is certainly not going to go gushing out of the filler tube. The aircraft's skin is held on with rivets, screws, nuts, bolts, a variety of different connecting hardware. It's important to check to make sure that they're all in place and that they're secured. One area that I find often gets overlooked, however, is here on the spinner. Most people are rightfully concerned about getting into the propeller disc for safety, which is well understood and reasonable. And they'll look at the screws here on the top of the spinner, but they don't look down underneath. This spinner is rotating at extremely high speeds and it's under quite a bit of stress. If for some reason it was to depart, 
it would lead to a pretty complicated flight scenario and you might regret not having taken just a little bit of extra effort to make sure that all the screws were in place. But this is just one system of many on the aircraft. As you go through, make sure that all the hardware is installed properly and seems tight and secure. And if you're ever in doubt or have a question, ask for a mechanic. They'll be more than happy to help you out. We've completed the pre-flight inspection. I now take a moment to go back and read through each of the items on here and actually say the words. I find that if you say the words, that helps sometimes trigger you to go, oh yeah, I forgot that one. Fuel quantity, fuel quality, caps, drains, vents, all the items on here may trigger, oh yeah, I forgot to do that, or I want to take an extra look. Once we've gone through all the items, then what I like to do is step back from the aircraft and go in the exact opposite order, whereas I went in a counterclockwise way initially, now I'm going to go clockwise. I'm back away from the aircraft. Now I can see the big picture items. Chocks and ropes are still on. I want them to be because it's a windy day, but this would be a good time to remove them. I can look here to see if there's any wingtip damage, perhaps from a neighboring aircraft. If it wasn't parked properly, that would be damage I'd be liable for if I didn't catch it. That's not on the checklist. It's on my checklist. From this distance, I can see the tops of the wings quite nicely. The two fuel caps are on, although I would have seen that from having done the fuel check, but now I can double check in case the fueler had been here. The antenna seems secure. As with the wing tips, I look to see if there's any parking rash from the aircraft behind us, if they kissed in the middle of the night. Make sure that that's all proper. This would be the point where I'd also see, oh, we've not put some luggage in, or a flight bag, a bicycle. The big picture items. Again, I'm not referring to my checklist. I'm just using the common sense. Does it look right? If we were actually flying today, I'd remove the final row, the final chalk, and then I'd go, oh, look what I forgot to do. That's why we take the time to step back go in the opposite direction and make sure everything seems in order. And of course, the last step on the pre-flight, collect your passengers. Ozzy, aircraft is ready to go. You ready to go? Let's have some fun. Get your headsets. Let's go get airborne.